So uh, we wanted to take some time over the lunch break day uh, today to discuss uh, an important topic that is really, it's been coming to light over the last few years, especially uh, with female CEOs, but uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is extremely important uh, in our world today. And, and how do we increase that within our investment communities and the work that we're doing? I certainly know as a female leader in this space uh, that there are some few and far between. And how do then we expand even further to that with getting into colored communities and really being able to expand our investor base as well as diversify and encourage our portfolios uh, to diversify their teams. So we brought together a panel today. Uh, we have Lorenzo, Rose, and Ralph here uh, to be able to help shed some light and talk a little bit about this important topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you yeah. for having um, so first, I'd just like to have you um, just briefly introduce yourself. Uh, let's go in the order that the slide is up. We'll start with Lorenzo and then go with Rose and then finish with Ralph. And then uh, we'll just we'll get into a few questions. First of all, I love that you found a headshot that is 16 years old of mine. That <laughs> I love that. But um, so my name is Lorenzo Tione. I am a managing director at Gangels. Gangels is the largest venture investment syndicate in service of the LGBTQ community and its allies. We represent the LGBTQ community, its allies on companies cap tables um, as a value aligned investor. And we invest in leadership teams that are embracing of LGBT leaders. Um, I'm also a founder of an organization called Startout, which is a not-for-profit that um, encourages and fosters growth in the LGBTQ entrepreneurial ecosystem by helping um, LGBTQ individuals start and grow their businesses through education, mentorship, connection to funding. Um, there's an accelerator and growth lab incubator program now. So I kind of sort of have lived at the intersection of venture and diversity for as it concerns the LGBTQ community for the better part of the last 15 years. Prior to that, I'm also an entrepreneur, started and grown a few businesses. One exited to Microsoft, some of the early foundational technology for Bing.com. And I'm also a writer producer on Broadway, although these days we are completely shut down. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you so much for being here, Rose. I've had a, the great honor of being on your Women in Business podcast. Why don't you share a little bit about the work that you're doing in this space? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for including me on this. I think that it's important, women supporting women. And so to your point, um, I created a Women in Business podcast really to essentially give women a platform to tell their stories and business and their struggles, right? And I think that if we have those types of types of uh, communications between um, everybody, um, then, then we start to include everybody, right? And so my background is in wireless. I was actually one of the largest partners for Cricket Wireless. We sold to AT&T in 2013. Um, at that, that time, we were uh, then, T-Mobile was acquiring Metro, and so I was asked to be a part of that. And so really just the wireless space. And I, I saw that we were one of only 2% of women uh, in the wireless space. And so uh, just saw the struggles. And, and so my focus is really uh, investing into female founders and female led companies. All right, great. Thank you, Rose. And then Ralph Vera, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we had a great discussion about IDE and how we can uh, provide more of that to the entrepreneur. So why don't you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with the First America? Thank you, Brianna. And I'm going to assume I'm coming through loud and clear. Yes, I can hear you just fine. It's good to be part of this Investor Capital Expo. And when it comes to inclusive demeanor, I want to just call out the fact that for the last 10 years, Nathan and Brianna and the Koretsu Forum uh, family have been very, very inclusive in uh, engaging with me. And that's been part of uh, the success that uh, I've been able to have as a consultant for the last 30 years, helping corporations and institutions recognize that diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, I mix the words around a little bit to come up with the grand idea, inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, is not just a business imperative, 
but it is certainly something that we all uh, have a stake in. Uh, I'm an ally for uh, what anyone that is interested in fostering entrepreneurship and success in business. That's been my main focus, particularly when it comes to helping diverse business enterprises uh, scale up and take advantage of the ability to engage in meaningful ways to build their businesses, to become profitable, and ultimately be able to grow and prosper using equity capital, not just debt capital. I think we all know, uh, as we've started out in, in business, you can, you can only get so far with debt capital. So when it comes to understanding equity capital and how it uh, can really accelerate the growth and certainly affect those communities like uh, Lorenzo. Thank you, Lorenzo, for what you're doing. And thank you as well, Rose, for what you're doing. It's just great to be able to get to meet people. And my, my definition of diversity is not only race, ethnicity, gender, and now age, thanks to uh, my ability to reach a certain age, but also life experiences and regional norms and family values and all. So all the communities that are represented today, as well as some others that perhaps are not necessarily represented yet, uh, that's whom I'm all about. So thank you, Brianna, for that chance to talk a little bit about what I do. All right, yeah, you bet. Well, that um, leads me to my first question, which is which is to all of you. Um, how how do we increase that core value? I know with Gangels especially, there is a core value with the portfolio companies that you have of you know having that diversity, equity, and inclusion. How do we as investors work with our existing portfolio companies? Because it seems like a great starting point um, to increase that going forward, and then as we look on to, to newer investments as well. Great. Thanks, Brianna. I'll, I'll be happy to, to uh, offer some thoughts. So I think that, you know, um, the key, I don't know that it's a realization, but certainly is the angle from which Gangel starts, is that the venture ecosystem is made of more than one participant. It's like a, this round table of participants that come together to create value. Um, there's the entrepreneur and their leadership team and the company. There is the boardroom, the investors, and ultimately the LPs or the check writers or the angels that benefit from um, that wealth and that wealth creation down the line. And we think it's really important to help companies navigate and identify the importance of that equity and representation across all stages and in all these sort of corners of the venture ecosystem. So one of the ways in which we do this is we, um, whenever we bring a, a company on board, we encourage them to review, read, and sign alongside with us a letter, which we make available also on our website, which is um, kind of a going through the pillars of what we care about when it comes to diversity and inclusion, which very much like Ralph was saying, is not limited to one dimension that we may know of because of where we come from. So we encourage all of our companies to look and sign the parity pledge when it comes to hiring and recruiting and creating a pipeline that is truly diverse. Um, parity pledge that now has been expanded to include people of color. We encourage them to look at the 1% pledge, which has um, a really great ability to influence communities that um, can greatly benefit from the wealth created by venture growth type of companies. We encourage them to discuss with their boards, not just an anti-discrimination policy, which of course they should have, um, but also um, the idea of creating representation in the boardroom, because we now know, we certainly know it for public companies, but the same lessons hold true for private companies, that more diverse companies are actually more financially performing companies. And that's true sort of in the rank and file of the staff of the organization. It's true in the C-suite executive, and it's true in the boardroom. And we also are co-signatories um, founding signatories on an initiative that is fairly recent and we think it is extremely important and uh, very much encapsulates so much of what Gangels exists for. And it's called the, the diverse diversity term sheet writer or the term sheet writer for diverse check writers, um, which is an initiative of a few uh, venture capital firms and we joined in as, as founding signatories that basically um, entrepreneurs and lead investors when they're first negotiating their term sheets 
can propose and commit to, which reserves some level of space in future growth rounds for diversity-based check writers. And why that is important is because it's actually, as we all know, because we are playing the venture game, is you um, make a lot of high risk, high returns bets in the very early get-go of a company, but that holds only as a good model if you're able to continue to commit and put capital to work as the ones, the, the fewer bets that uh, turns out to be the ones that work out um, are um, able, you know, that you're basically able to continue to, to invest capital. And so often the access to those greatly, greatly de-risked de and opportunities that come into, into later stage growth are then sort of gobbled up by the more uh, powerful investors who all unfortunately still tend to come from um, homogeneous groups and homogeneous financial and educational socioeconomic backgrounds. So opening up the opportunity for more diverse back check writers and communities that may very well have the ability financially to invest but that traditionally have not had the access could have a profound impact on the overall ecosystem. Well, and that really brings you know, together just the community of Koretsu because Koretsu, we, we work together as investors knowing that our different backgrounds and expertise can really help provide better diligence on these companies and that we can't be experts in everything. And so diversity has been very important to me, but as a female leader of this organization, I'm still hovering around you know, 22% of my membership base being women. And so Rose, I mean, I guess my question for you would be what, you know, what can we do to, you know, help make this environment more comfortable and help people feel welcome um, to this community? Because I've always felt our members do such a great job and, and they're so supportive and they, they certainly helped me early on, but it's just, I feel like there's these barriers and this walls um, that I'm still not bringing in that diversity that I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, to your point, I think you're absolutely right. And um, creating those safe spaces, I think that as women, um, women handle business a lot different than men do. And this is not men versus women. This is about creating that environment where we have that communication about some of the issues that women do face when they're raising capital. I think that, you know, as I was building out the podcast and, and giving women this opportunity, I'd hear these stories that were really heartbreaking, right? I mean, um, whether it be stories of women saying that they, you know, couldn't raise capital because um, some of them say that they didn't fit the, the right look, right? And so having these type of, um, I, I think talks is important for the simple fact that women need to feel comfortable in order to feel confident in what they're doing. Um, and, and I'd love to see more women getting involved in investing in understanding the process. I think women take a little bit longer to go through that process and they have to digest it and really understand it before they can feel comfortable to deploy capital in a variety of com you know companies and that's why um, I think we've seen some of the statistics out there when 2.9 percent of the women are getting the venture funding and then during COVID it's gone down to 2.7 uh, because women are wearing so many different hats right and we kind of just discussed this a little bit, Brianna, uh, last week is, is that, you know, especially, you know, as a mom, you know, you're pulled in all these different directions and you're running a company and you're, you know, looking to raise capital. Um, it takes its toll. And so having these kinds of conversations, having these types of environments that I see you, you know, a lot of women talk about supporting other women, but then you, you see this cattiness that goes on. But one of the things I really appreciate about you is, is that um, you've really given me the chance to get to know who you are and, and get to know who your company is. And so that for me, um, I like to do business with people I like, right? And I think to, to, to anybody's point, we like, we like to do business with people we like, right? And especially for women. Um, if they... You know, and, and, and one of the things I think I talk about, it's, it's not men versus women or, you know, black versus white. It's, it's really about women against women. And, and, and if we, you know, can stop all of that and allow uh, women to feel comfortable, we're going to have better results. 
Yeah, I, I do. I do understand a little bit of what you're saying. And I, you know, women do need to support women and lift each other up. It doesn't always happen. Uh, it's an interesting world in which we live. And hopefully COVID has helped shed more of that uh, supportive light on things. Uh, but with that and talking about support, Ralph, um, I would really like to talk a little bit more about that that equity capital and that, you know, equity to opportunity, right? And that access. And so, you know, one of the things that keeps coming back to us again and again, um, and part of the reason why I started out with our portfolio companies and what we already have to work with is we talk a lot about just pipeline challenges. We're looking at these opportunities within our community and, and how do we, you know, get, get that access to those diverse companies, those diverse CEOs, um, I find so much of it is built off of trust and there's just so much lack of trust out there uh, with what's gone on. So can you just talk a little bit about that on-ramp and that building ramp and something that investors can be taking into account as um, we look and assess that opportunities that we might want to bring into our portfolio? Thank you, Brianna, for that. The Black Lives Matter movement has certainly revealed a tremendous number of disparities and it is, uh, I think, in the best enlightened interests of investors and, and uh, equity investors and individual portfolio managers, managers to look at what is the sustainability of recognizing that diverse population groups offer up an opportunity and a chance to really make a significant difference and to move things into the direction that uh, we know we all need America to move into. And that is ability for individuals to be able to sustain themselves, sustain their families, sustain their communities. And obviously the pandemic has exacerbated those disparities because it has sequestered all of us in different forms and formats. So this, uh, this whole notion that has been proven time and time again by much greater authorities than myself, that diversity of thought, diversity of perspective, diversity of uh, motivation is an incredible value to any corporation, any business entity at all. It's been proven over and over again. So now the question is, how, how can that diversity that adds value to any business entity be made sure that it comes into play when uh, the investment communities that Caretsu Forum represents, as well as angel investors, et cetera, the different sources of equity capital. How can that become part and parcel of the institutionalization of diversity and inclusion and equity? Uh, I know it can be done. And I can tell you that those population groups that I'm most familiar with, particularly minority, women-owned, veteran-owned businesses, LGBTQ, disabled-owned businesses, they have been able to create success at a certain level. And that next level of being able to energize their enterprises using equity capital, I don't assume they understand the terminology, what it takes in order to position themselves and to be at that point in time where individuals who can invest in the entrepreneurship, in the ability for them to be able to take other people's capital other people's wealth and maximize it for wealth creation in that business, in that community, in those workers. And in turn, those investors get a nice return on their investment. That's, that's the secret sauce that we all have to add our ingredients in so that ultimately Caretsu Forum and other angel investment groups, as well as other equity players that are in the marketplace, uh, can capitalize pardon the pun, on an underserved, underutilized formula for success. Hopefully right. that makes a bit of sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's a big topic. I mean, we could spend an entire day talking about how to increase ID, um, IDE into, um, into our work, into our communities. Um, we are running short on time. I would love to finish up with one last question and know if you have any resources um, that you would recommend, maybe a book 
or a resource that you would provide um, to the investors on the call today uh, that they might want to look into if this is something that they're looking to explore within their own portfolios. Uh, and then I would kindly ask if you'd be willing to put your contact information into the chat window if uh, one of our members wants to reach out um, and help increase uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in, uh, in their portfolios, that would be amazing. So Lorenzo, let's uh, one, one, one key resource for you. Um, so first of all, my uh, email is lorenzo at angels.com. You can also scan the, um, the QR code uh, and you get all of my contact information. Um, very happy to talk to anybody. I don't know that I would point you necessarily to one specific resource. What I would say is um, I mentioned Start Out and Start Out, one of the, of the things that we've been doing for the last couple of years at Start Out has been to really try and ground some of the economic impact of diversity, especially when it comes right now because of the data that we have to women entrepreneurs and LGBTQ entrepreneurs through something that we call the uh, Start Out um, uh, Entrepreneurial Economic Impact Index. And it's available on the startout.org website. And you can really go, and I encourage any, anybody to go and see, because you can slice and cut the data and see the amount of jobs created, amount of funding uh, raised, and amount of innovation in terms of patent created by these populations. And this is really critical. And what that data does is that it allows you to estimate the headroom, how much more uh, impact would be available if more LGBTQ entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs were funded in certain areas. It's really fascinating data. Um, there's a lot of really cool uh, information on the startout.org website. And then I encourage everybody to become, you know, if you want and you're interested, become a member of the Angels because it doesn't really, it expands your view in terms of, of the type of um, both companies that we look at, but also how we approach diversity and equity from the point of view of who is in the decision process as much as possible. I hope that helps. Thank you, Lorenzo. Rose? Um, you know, for me and my end, uh, I encourage people to look at, there's so many different women, um, I think accelerators out there. Um, as an investor, I, I, I think I would encourage people to, you know, look at some of the different uh, women organizations that do support women. Um, there's a ton of them out there. Um, and so even if you just Google around, um, I think that there's a lot of um, accelerators for women, a lot of uh, women focused um, angel groups. Um, that's that's uh, my advice. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. And then Ralph, real quick to finish this off. I would recommend that anyone that's interested in getting a good sense of what implicit bias we all have within our personalities. We have a book called Blind Spot. And I found it very enlightening and it gave me a, fr a frame of reference that I didn't realize was very important, not only in my perspective, but also in, in the perspective of people that I encounter that I work to develop relationships with. So that would be my answer. So it's funny you mentioned implicit bias. So just an example for the people on the call really quick. One thing, uh, the, the unconscious bias that I find day in and day out is that the school only emails me when it comes to the kids and there's two parents. So um, it's one thing that actually really frustrates me uh, quite a bit because there's two of us and I, I'm not the only one that manages it. So, uh, but that's just an example of just this unconscious way of thinking uh, that we, we don't really see or understand and how we become more aware about that. So thank you so much to Lorenzo, Rose, and Ralph uh, for being on with us today, talking a little bit about this important topic. Um, we can certainly, you know, keep the doors open and talk more. Anybody on um, the call today, if you, if you want to learn more about this or if you want connections, please reach out to me. Uh, it's important and near and dear to my heart, especially as a female business leader. Uh, with that, we're going to turn it over to Nathan to introduce our next keynote speaker. Thank you all so much again. So grateful for the time.